name is Curtis. I'm blessed to be the pastor here at the Salem United Methodist Church. Uh, I, I recognize that this is one of those beautiful times of the year where some people will come and check out other churches or perhaps you're with family. Uh, whenever we have guests in our church family, I like to say something very specific. Know that you are always welcome here. Never feel pressure to come here. If you already have a church family, we celebrate that. We believe that we all worship the same Jesus. We don't got different ones. And so that is great. We're, we're excited that you already have a church family. If you don't have somewhere where you feel like you are home, where you belong, you are always welcome to check this place out. And I always make people this promise, and I have fulfilled it when asked to. If Salem doesn't fit for you, let me know, and I will help you find a local church that does fit for you, United Methodist or otherwise. We all worship the same Jesus. Uh, did everybody get a candle on the way in? Anybody not get one that would like one? Okay, cool. So, it is a beautiful and ancient tradition of the church that on Christmas Eve, during the last song, which is often silent night, we take the Christ candle, representing the fact that on this night we remember and celebrate that our Savior's light broke into the darkness. And we come down the middle aisle, and the light is spread out to each person. And so just a little tip of how to do so, I invite those who have unlit candles and turn them sideways, light them, turn them vertical, and the next person who has an unlit candle next to them, turn it sideways to light it. This helps you not get wax on your hands and on the pews. Okay? Um, and then following service, if you blow them off, there'll be a basket at the uh, back of the church. Uh, also, uh, for some of you that have been attending Salem, you know that we had a, a very unique 2 p.m. Christmas Eve drive-in service today, where we were able to get a hold of a short-range radio transmitter. Um, beginning in the latter part of January, early part of February, we're going to start broadcasting on 91.7 FM radio our worship church service for those who don't feel safe coming into the church. Um, and we'll be ending worship a few minutes early for that service so that we can go outside and wave to our friends who haven't seen us in months. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, just please know that that is coming um, very soon. Is there anything else for those of you that are part of our, our church family for the good of the family? For those of you that attend Salem, you know that we've been praying for Ruth Longhurst, a longtime member. Um, Ruth went home to be with our Lord and Savior this morning. And Jim, her husband, wanted me to specifically let you know that, and to let you know that um, though it hurts, it's a good thing. She's been struggling with ALS for years, and, and he said she gets to dance and sing and celebrate Jesus' birthday with him in a more free way than she's been in years. We join you for a word of opening prayer. Heavenly Father God, on this most beautiful and sacred of nights, we come together as your people. We come together as family. Family of the heart, family from across the land, family because of you. We pray, Lord, that you would not just come into this place, but you would take over, for you are the head of the family. We pray that everything we do in this place will be beautiful to you, and we'll be very careful to give you and only you all the glory, honor, and praise, now and forever. Amen. Good evening. Would you please stand as you are able and join in singing our opening hymn, that came upon the midnight clear on page 218.
Um, the Advent season is the roughly 40 days before Christmas that we use to prepare our hearts and our souls to once again celebrate the birth of our Savior. In a very similar way to Lent being the roughly 40 days before Easter that the church has always used as a time of preparing our hearts and our souls to once again remember the resurrection of our Savior. It is a tradition of the church that throughout the weeks, the four weeks of Advent, that a candle is lit and a different focus is emphasized. If you would join me tonight as we prepare ourselves as we light these candles once again and light the Christ candle, we will go through this uh, responsive reading. I'll read the parts in white if you read the parts in yellow. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. We are here to worship God and His Son Jesus. Lord, and bless the name of your name. And to the light of the name 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 of the candle, we thank God for the gift of His Son, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. We thank God that through Christ, His life has come into the world and made it possible for us to truly see and in seeing His rejoice, His truth, His love, and His rare self transform all who receive Him. Let us pray.
congregation and have been for many years now to help them lead us in worship. Uh, if you got your Bibles, grab them. We are going to head over to Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Now, if you didn't know this, the Christmas story actually appears in the Bible in three different locations uh, in the Gospels. Uh, and it's interesting because the, the primary two that most of us think of is actually in the same chapter, chapter 2. Matthew 2 and Luke 2. Mark, for some odd reason, really doesn't even touch the topic. And John is like this creative, eclectic, artistic type. If you've ever heard the first part of John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 115, it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's John's account of the Christmas story. But what's interesting is, in, um, in Matthew's account, Matthew chapter 2, it, it talks about uh, the, the Magi and King Herod. In Luke chapter 2, it talks about the shepherds and the angels. But those are the only places it talks about those two things. So it's kind of cool to get the fullness of the story. You always kind of wonder where those parts are at. That's where they're at. So from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 16, listen to this from the Word of God. At that time, the Roman Emperor, Augustus, decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinus was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the, from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiance, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snuggly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news. They'll bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angels were joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. So I don't know if you've heard of this. There's this really neat new Van Gogh exhibit that's been going around the country. I heard about this like a year and a half ago, and I was really jazzed. I wanted to go check it out, but at that time I could only find it in New York, and I don't have the money to travel to New York just to see a Van Gogh exhibit, you know. Um, it's called the Van Gogh Immersion Experience. And recently I found out it's actually coming to South Florida. I'm really getting excited about this. My wife and I and our family are going to go down there. Now, if you haven't heard of this, here's what it is. You go into this building, and every wall, the floor, the ceiling, all of it is a projection of one of Van Gogh's paintings. And the whole time the painting is gently moving. So you can literally walk through Starry Night. <clears throat> I thought that was so neat. I wanted to check it out. And as I'm thinking about this and praying about today, something that kind of hit me. Well, what if Van Gogh actually had the ability to have this experience? Right? Well, what if Vincent Van Gogh could actually step into one of his paintings? I mean, some of y'all here are artists. You, you, you love to do art, even if you don't think you're good at it. You like to do art. You like to make things. Perhaps you like to take pictures. You're a photographer. 
photographer? But even if you're not, could you imagine for a minute, if you could paint anything and be great at it, what would you want to paint? Or take a photograph and just be like, oh, that's a perfect photograph. Imagine what that would be for a minute. Now imagine having the ability to actually step into that painting. But whatever it is, the perfect landscape, an old barn, um, a beach scene, whatever it is. Could you imagine getting to step into your artwork? Y'all, I wonder if in part this is what it was like for Jesus. I mean, have you looked around this world? This place is beautiful. It is the most natural state. I mean, if you look at a sunset, if you look at a sunrise, all the millions and billions of blades of grass, the, the countless different kinds of flowers and trees. I mean, have you seen some of the animals on the earth? Somebody was really creative to make those, right? This, you, are God's artwork. You are a beautiful piece of artwork that, that God skillfully crafted and took time on you because you're worth it. And Jesus, Jesus, as the creator, the artist, stepped into the painting. Then now, as, as I'm thinking about this, my mind and my imagination is going. I think of some of those paintings where, where there's people in the painting, and, and what would it be like for Van Gogh to step into that? Uh, he, he would probably have all these people like, oh my gosh, you're amazing, we love you, it's the artist, right? But Van Gogh would be different. He would be from the outside. He would not be the same as them. He is removed from the painting, if you will. He's not a part of the painting organically. He just stepped in and he stepped out at his leisure. And in the same way we talk about the fact that our God is outside of time and space. Scripture says a thousand years is like the blink of an eye, and the blink of an eye is like a thousand years to God. He is beyond us. He is above us. We are finite beings. We have a beginning and an end. Tomorrow ain't here yet, and yesterday's only memory. But God is outside of that space. And this is where it starts to differ, because what if, what if Van Gogh didn't enter the painting as the artist, but what if he became one of the people in the painting? Yo, is that not exactly what Jesus did? I mean, could you begin to imagine for a minute what it must have been like for him? Here it is. This all-powerful, all-knowing, perfect being who's never experienced the physical things we do. And yet, here's Jesus for the very first time experiencing his tummy being hungry. For the very first time experiencing the cold of the night. I was talking with another pastor friend of mine, and we were bouncing ideas around with this. And we said, what, what must it have been like for him the very first things that Jesus Christ experienced. Right? Some of the first feelings he ever physically felt was that itchy pain and those warm, snuggly strips of cloth. The coldness of the stone as he would lay in that stone manger. Some of the first things that he would have ever heard would have been the sound of the voice of the people he created. I'm not sure I can grasp that one. The first thing he ever would have seen with human eyes would be the smiles of his parents that he made looking at him. The first thing that Jesus would have ever tasted would have been his mother's milk. I mean, this is a radical concept. And here in the church, we talk a lot about the fact that, that Jesus was fully God and fully human. And if he wasn't fully human, if he was only God, then he didn't actually die on the cross. God can't die. So there was no sacrifice. So the church is pointless. If he wasn't fully God, then he wasn't the perfect sacrifice. He was just another schmuck that died on the cross. And even if he did raise from the dead, he wasn't perfect. And so, so Jesus needed to be fully God and fully human. Shh. Children, calm your cuteness. Thank you. <laughs> and here's the radical part about this, y'all, okay? When we read in the Bible that the wages of sin 
sin is death, right? The wages, the, the, the cost, the punishment. But Jesus never sinned. And, and so he like, went to jail for something he never did, you know? And because he was prosecuted, he died for something he never did, he never sinned, death literally could not hold on to him. Death broke. And when we accept Jesus Christ in our hearts, when we recognize that we are made in the image of God, that you hold value to God, all right, you are made in His image. God would not make you in His image if you did not hold value to Him. And because you can never stop being made in His image, you can never stop holding value to God. All right? So when we accept Jesus Christ in our hearts, when we move a little closer to that image, if you will, we have some Christ in us. That, that same Christ that broke death, that was perfect. So this is how, in my limited brain, I begin to understand how we get to go to heaven. And, and so here he is, the artist. He not only steps into the artwork, he becomes a part of the artwork. He, he becomes one of the people in the artwork. And again, when we talk a lot in the church, about the fact that Jesus experienced what we do. He experienced temptation, suffering, hurt. He experienced a, a hungry tummy. As a baby, he experienced a full diaper, right? Jesus experienced it all. But with something radical that kind of struck me up on this, Jesus didn't show up as an adult. I mean, if it was just about the sacrifice, he could have just shown up as an adult, taught for maybe two or three years, died on the cross, rose again, back to heaven, and skipped that whole awkward teenager phase. Right? Jesus was born. I mean, grasp this for a minute. Jesus came into the world, the creator of the universe, the most powerful being in existence, came in so humbly that he was 100% dependent on mom and dad. Jesus was a kid. Jesus was a teenager. Jesus was like a young adult. Jesus experienced the fullness of the life cycle. You know, when we, we talk about the fact that Jesus was born in a manger in the most humble of places. He wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't born surrounded by royalty. He wasn't born in comfort. He was born to peasants in a barn. And who were some of the first people to see him? It wasn't even the well-to-do magi, was it? It was some stinky, socially awkward shepherds. Some Hebrew shepherds. But still, the magi did come later, didn't they? And if you were here with us in worship last year, you know we talked a little bit about this. The word magi, that's a strange word. Where does that come from? The word magi actually refers to the name of a priest of a pagan religion. The Zoroastrian religion. It's their word for pastor, magi. Yet yeah, they were the first ones to recognize the prophecies of the Hebrew Old Testament coming true. And they came with their gifts of frankincense, gold, and myrrh. A spice that's used to burn in the holy temple for God, divinity. A, a spice that's used in burial, sacrifice, and gold, which throughout history is often represented royalty. Pagan priests brought our Jesus gifts of sacrifice, divinity, and royalty. I mean, grasp this, if you will, between the Matthew and the Luke scriptures. We have Hebrews who are humble, socially awkward, smell bad, outcasts, the shepherds. And then we have these well-to-do, highly educated, pagan priests. And they both came to see Jesus. Yo, but this is just evidence that our Jesus really is for the greatest of people to the least of people. Uh, across backgrounds, skin colors, across nations, across languages, across highly educated, low educated, uh, across those who feel like that they are highly gifted or not gifted very much at all. That Jesus really is for all people in all places at all times. I mean, can you, the radicalness of uh, those two groups of people. Maybe that's why Matthew and Luke want to emphasize those two stories for us so much. And yet I'm still kind of stuck on the fact that Jesus came as 
a baby, that, that he went through life with us. He experienced what we do. You know, um, and as I kind of think about that, I think about when I experience life with other people. Y'all, when I go through really deep, hard life with people, when we share a moment of a birth, when I get to see their kid for the first time, when, when I get to walk with them through a divorce, or a death, or a graduation, or a marriage, you know, our relationship changes. It's never quite the same. That there's, a, there's a closeness that develops. I, I, I trust them more, and they tend to trust me more. I tend to be closer to them. Whether I'm a preacher or it's just my friend outside of the church. When those kinds of things happen, that there's this depth of our relationship that develops. That they, they tend to be the people that we go to when, when we need someone to talk to. That these are the people we go to when, when times are hard and you just you need someone to be there with you. Even if they don't know what to do. When something awesome happens, they're the first ones you want to call, Right? When you're bored, they're the ones you want to give a call and say, hey, let's go do something together. There's this depth, this intimacy, if we can use that word in its truest sense. There's this closeness that happens when you share true, deep life together. Yo, here's the radical part that caught me this year. Okay, We celebrate Easter because our Savior died upon the cross for our sins, rose again, ascended to heaven, and invites us into eternity with him. The artist is inviting the artwork to join him outside of the painting and in the forever. That's cool. That's why we celebrate Easter. But for me, for Curtis this year, he didn't just start as an adult. He experienced the fullness of life. He experienced anger and betrayal and temptation and hunger and pain and suffering. He experienced what I experienced. And I believe a big part of that is not just so we can go, Jesus gets where I'm coming from because he's been there. But because when I go through those situations with somebody, I feel closer to him. Jesus wants that kind of relationship with you. And it ain't just about salvation. It ain't just about punch your Jesus card and you get out of hell free tickets. No, he wants to be your best friend. He, he wants to have your back. He wants to be there for you. That, that closeness that you have, that closest that you even want. It's interesting, if we really are made in the image of God, and we all want that kind of relationship, it makes sense to believe that God wants that too. So we celebrate the resurrection in eternity because of love. But this year, for me, I celebrate Christmas because my God wants to be my best friend. And he must be yours too. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much for wanting to walk with us, to, to go through life with us, to get in the muck of things and to celebrate the good. We thank you, God, that, that when you stepped into the artwork, you didn't just step in as the great, royal, holy one, but and you went through life with us. All because you wanted to be that close to us. Teach us, Lord, how to be open to that kind of relationship with Teach us how to respond to that in ways that are organic to who we are. And teach us to be that person for somebody else. We pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. It is a tradition of the church that on this holy night, we prepare ourselves to receive the holy sacrament of communion. Now given the uniqueness of this year, I want to give you some instructions and some clarity. I always say, first and foremost, that everyone is welcome here. This is not Salem's table. It is not the United Methodist table. If you've accepted Jesus Christ in your heart and you earnestly seek a relationship with him, you are welcome at this table. In the same way, I often say no one is required to come up here. No one is going to look at you funny if you don't. Especially during this time, if you are uncomfortable with coming forward, please know that's okay. The act of force is not the bread, it is not the juice, and it is not the preacher. It is God, so you can receive within your own heart. 
In the same way, we have individually packaged Holy Communion with the bread or the juice in a cup, a layer of film, a little wafer, and another layer. It's completely sanitized for your uh, comfort. I will be putting on gloves and a mask when we get to that point, and I will invite you to line up, come up the center, and I will drop it into your hands if you wish to receive. But as we do so, let's prepare our hearts. We belong to the next slide for me. Once again, I'll read the parts in white, if you will read the parts in yellow. The life-giving light of the Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts in joy. Amen. Let us give thanks to our friend and redeemer, the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing. Always and everywhere, give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You created light out of the darkness and brought forth light onto the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity to sin and made the covenant promise to be our sovereign God, spoken through your prophets. In the fullness of time, you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior, born in the humblest humbleness of a manger, witnessed by the lowly shepherd, and welcomed by a sacred chorus of angels as they sing. Glory to you in the highest, and the peace on earth for all your people. And so, with your people on earth, in all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their honor and be
You got your candles? Because uh, receiving Holy Communion in this way is a little different and a little more uh, time consuming, we'll begin this tradition on the second verse. On the second verse, I will come down wearing my mask, processing the Christ candle. Uh, we invite you to, uh, to come towards the center aisle for those of you on the ends. Once again, a reminder to lean your candle sideways to light it and then pass the light on down as we go. And it's just a beautiful thing. I always love to see it every year to watch the light of Christ literally spread throughout the church. Okay. Will you please stand as you are able and join in singing our closing hymn, Silent Night. We're starting the first verse. I'm going to walk out in the second. I'm sorry. times in my life where light really did break into some deep darkness. It was often because somebody just gave a care. Somebody took the time to love on me and spend some time with me. Somebody was the listening ear, whether I needed to vent 
or I needed a gentle correction. <laughs> this is a night where throughout history we have remembered that light breaks in the darkness. But as you physically hold the light, and for those of us that have accepted him in our hearts, you spiritually hold the light. I challenge you to go out and be that light for somebody else. I challenge you to go out and know that that light warms you. It vibrate, vibrant, makes us vibrant. It fills us. And all that light comes from our Savior. Receive that as your mission and your blessing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.